Hi everyone, this is Luke from Cocos. I pretty much covered the basics of Shader in the last video, but the most important part is the application of WebGL and how it's implemented in Cocos Creator. Because all game development tools are wrapped in a graphics rendering API at the bottom of the rendering layer. So once you know the principle, you can easily use the different game development tools to develop the desired effect. This video is mainly supplemental to make some additions and extensions. It mainly includes these parts. The first one is the memory layer of UVO. The second is the use of the WebGL frame grabbing tools. So let's look, take a look at the first supplementary point, UVO memory layout. In the last video, we know that all non-sampler uniform in Cocos Creator must be included in the block. At this point, some developers may ask, why can't we just declare uniform like previous WebGL bases? Well, why must we must place a block? And what is this block? Well, let's understand what a block is and why we need it to store uniform. This block is actually the uniform blocks in the shading language GLSL. It brings together a large number of variables of uniform type and manages them in a unified way. For programs that need a lot of uniform variables, it can significantly improve performance. The equivalent of this in WebGL is UBO. The UBO stands for Uniform Buffer Object. It is a buffer object used to store the uniform type variables in the shading language. Using UBO allows uniform variables to be shared across shaders. It is also possible to set and update uniform variables in a shading language program. Thus, uniform blocks have several features compared to the traditional way of setting a single uniform variable. It has several features. The first is that the more uniform variables can be stored. Secondly, it simplifies the process of setting a large number of uniform variables. The third is the ability to switch between the different UBO bindings and the ability to quickly update the values of uniform variables in a single coloring language program. That can be implemented in a different coloring language programs. The fourth can update a uniform variable in a different shading language program by updating the data in the UBO. I'll continue with the property test from the previous video here. I'll quickly delete a few properties to explain this part. First, create a test effect. Then, let's create a test material. Then, let's the materials effect resource use a test effect. And then quickly declare a few properties and corresponding uniform. Next, let's see how the editor behaves. Here we have an error message. The reason for the error is that the UBO layout is wrong. Well, why does this problem occur? This is because at the low level parts of the engine, consider that UBO is the only basic unit for efficient data reuse in the rendering pipeline. Discrete declarations are no longer an option. Therefore, the uniform declaration has stricter requirements on data allocation. For example, there should be no VEC3 members for members of the array type. The size of each element cannot be smaller than VEC4, and any member's declaration order that introduces padding is not allowed. Let's look at the padding rules first. The first rule is that all VEC3 members will be padded to VEC4. I took a look at this example. Even if the declaration is a VEC3 uniform, which is a floating point of 4 bytes, it is implicitly padded to 16 bytes for VEC4. Then look at the second rule. Arrays and structures of any length less than VEC4 will fill the element to VEC4. Look at the example on the figure below. Block consists of an array with four floating point members. And since each component of the array is smaller than VEC4, so each component is automatically filled to VEC4, which takes up 64 bytes. So the logical UA to use here is to declare a VEC4 for it. The last rule is that the actual offset of all members in the UBO are aligned to the number of bytes that it occupies. You can take a look at this example. How many bytes does this block take up in the end? Have you figured it out? It's 32 bytes. The first float is distributed in a four byte units. And the second V2 is distributed in eight bytes. So there is one byte of distribution between it and the first uniform. We could take a look at this diagram to illustrate this distribution. 
So the correct layout is to declare the VEC4 first, then VEC2, and finally declare float. Where float can be used VEC4, then use VEC4. What I mean it to do here is that if you use the target configuration when declaring properties to fill one of the VEC4 components with data, the same is true for VEC2 data. So let's start fixing the misconfiguration. I'm declaring a VEC4 here to hold A, D, and E. Then back to the editor. You can see that this time the error is reported again. It's reporting a rename. It says that the name of our constant UBO has been renamed. Then change its name. Uh, let's change its name to test params. Okay, we go back and we can look at it again. And this time there's no problem. We know that all about the UBO memory layout support. Well, next, let's look at the next point, WebGL frame grabbing tools. Before we explain the WebGL frame grabber tool and why we should use it, we need to understand one thing first. What is a draw call? A draw call is a progr graphics programming interface that the CPU calls, such as DirectX or OpenGL, to command the GPU to perform rendering operations. A draw call is actually the CPU sending a draw command to the GPU. If there are 80 objects to be drawn on the scene, then it's possible to submit about 80 draw calls. That is, the GPU needs to draw 80 times in one rendering frame. A high dry call, draw call will directly affect the overall performance of a game and can cause lag. So you need to know the draw call information and submit as much node data as possible. So we need a tool to help us analyze what each draw call draws. We need to optimize the data in an appropriate way so that the same rendering data can be merged. This tool is also called the frame grabber. On the web, spectre.js is a good tool for draw call analysis. You can find the plugin by searching the spectre.js on the Google store. You can click into the plugin panel and then select add to the top right corner. Because I've already added it here, it shows that I will remove it from Chrome if I click this. So let's run the project first. Then you see, you will see that the icon in the top right, a corner of Chrome. This is the spectre.js icon. If the button is grayed out, it means that the current page cannot capture frames. Click on the icon button to activate it. Then click on the red button to jump to the frame grabbing panel. On this page, you can see what the current frame has rendered. The left side of the screen can be interpreted as the command currently being executed. What is the final effect on the screen? Well, we are presented here in the form of a screenshot. You can click to see the first two. Both are clear operations. Because there are two cameras in the scene, so two clear operations are done. The next one is the rectangular drawing command. We'll talk about this later. The, the middle part is the command panel, which shows the list of commands to be executed during the frame capture. This is displayed in chronological order. The color codes are used to highlight problems and can identify draw calls. The ones in the orange background are selected commands. The ones in the blue background are draw calls and clear commands. Green command names are valid commands, which means their state of value is updated. Orange command names are redundant commands, which means that their value applied is the same as the current one. This helps to optimize WebGL applications. Red command names are WebGL commands that are not recommended for use. Both red and green are not yet present in our kernel panel, current panel. So next, let's look to the right. When we select the command, all of its details will be displayed on the right side, including the command name, parameters, and JavaScript call stack. If the draw call is selected, the various states involved in that call are available. This is usually a fairly long list of information because a frame capture contains a state. An exhaustive list of states, attachments, program shaders, UBOs, transform feedbacks, and other and their attached properties are in the command panel. We can also link to the shader source code via vertex or fragment to jump to the shader source code. This is what the vertex shader performs. Next, let's look at the fragment shader. First, a quick look at a few buttons. You can think of it as a screenshot. That is, a screenshot of what's being drawn in the current frame. The second one is some information about the current command. It's good to get a general idea. Then this is the initial state information record. This is the end state information record. It's a, bit, a little bit easier to understand. And finally, there's one more point to remind you. When choosing the re rendering backend, try to choose WebGL1 backend instead of WebGL2, because the information in WebGL1 backend will be displayed more clearly, while WebGL2 will be more ambiguous. 
so try to choose WebGL1 for frame grabbing test. The switch between WebGL1 and WebGL2 can be set through the project settings, right here. Here you can choose to check WebGL1, but not WebGL2. That's it for this video. Next video, we'll start to explain extended content mixing and testing. So, we'll see you in the next video.